recognizing the importance of the Temple Mount to peoples of all three monotheistic faiths, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Israel reaffirms its commitment to upholding unchanged the status quo on the Temple Mount, in word and in practice. The prophet Yechezkel, Ezekiel, he received a vision of the third temple from Hashem. Hashem gave him a vision of the third temple. Hashem told Yechezkel that the people should get involved in the building of the third temple, of the temple. When the Mikdash is rebuilt, there will be Tahiyah HaMethim, the, the reviving, the rising of the dead, and uh, several other things of this type were described there. The author of these words, of these sentences, are conflating, first of all, the concept of the Mikdash with other concepts which in their mind are, are all wrapped up together into one package. Amongst American Christians, known mostly as Evangelics, there's a teaching on the end times, the prevailing opinion that the Antichrist will certainly be Jewish and during his reign he will sit in the Jerusalem Temple. In order for this to be possible, the Temple in Jerusalem must be rebuilt without fail. There's already preparations happening. They say the Temple must be rebuilt in the place of Al-Aqsa. Evangelics believe the Jewish Messiah will sit there and rule the world, only for a limited period until Jesus comes down and saves the day. May the masters of theology forgive me, but such an approach seems rather anti-Semitic to me. I know this is a bold statement to make, but there's literally nothing in the Bible to suggest the rebuilding of the Third Temple by removing the Holy Mosque of Al-Aqsa. Let me give you the passage from the New Testament, and I quote, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day comes until the apostasy comes first, and the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed, resisting and exalting himself above everything that is called God or holiness, so that he sits in the temple of God, like God, posing as God. Not only is there no direct reference to the temple in Jerusalem, Saint Paul wrote this. He was a Greek-speaking Jew. He used the Greek word naios here, meaning a place of dwelling for a god. Nowhere does it state the Antichrist will sit in the temple in Jerusalem. The Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and he will declare to the whole world that he is God. And St. Paul, being from a Jewish background himself, why would he leave the statement so vague? If indeed a third temple must be rebuilt for the Antichrist to sit there, surely he would have clarified. Why is there such a battle for the city of Jerusalem? Because God the Father has promised his son Jesus Christ that that would be the capital city of his kingdom. Satan also has a son. The Bible calls him the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist. And Satan wants his son to rule earth from Jerusalem. There is a vicious supernatural war that's raging right now over who owns Jerusalem. You see, the evangelist Christians, especially from America, like to play religious gymnastics with these texts. They give it the meaning they want, usually for political reasons as we see today. For this text that I quoted, they used the word heros to designate the temple in Jerusalem. Heros means holy, so the interpretation that the son of perdition will certainly sit down in the Jerusalem temple is quite far-fetched. If you want to believe in that prophecy, then surely it would rather mean that he will sit down in some sacred place, not necessarily the third temple in Jerusalem. Of course, I take a big risk, but I dare to assume that the temple in Jerusalem should not and will not be restored. And why do I believe that? Because even the rabbis and the Talmudists argue over this. By the way, if you don't know the difference between the Talmud and the Torah, then you should. The Torah is from God. The Talmud was written by man. 
nothing divine about the Talmud. The Talmud is a record of rabbinic debates in the 2nd to the 5th century on the teachings of the Torah, their interpretations, how they understood it. And in those books, you'll find their views on the temple in Jerusalem. Some of these rabbis believed, and I quote Rabbi Shlomo Yisaki from France, a contributor to the Talmud. He said that the temple will miraculously appear, already completely rebuilt. Other rabbis thought that the Messiah King, the Anointed One, will build the temple after he strengthens his throne. Forget the Torah and the Talmud. The Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh, also known as Mikra, contains prophecies and there's literally not enough direct indication of the fact that the temple must and will be restored before the coming of the Messiah. So where did they get all this nonsense from? The Jewish sages of the early Talmudic period themselves noticed disturbing signs long before the destruction of the second temple. There are supposedly records and I want you to take note of this record. One of them is that 40 years before the destruction of the second temple, the lamp inside the temple, previously inextinguishable, began to go out and the gates of the sanctuary began to open by themselves. The Talmudic concept of the Messiah coming the temple being rebuilt and the record that a flame went out in the second temple is actually all copied from ancient Zoroastrianism. Sometimes called the official religion of ancient Persia, Zoroastrianism is one of the world's oldest surviving religions with teachings older than Buddhism older than Judaism and far older than Christianity. Zoroastrianism is thought to have arisen in the late second millennium BCE. Contrary to propaganda by people who have half knowledge, Zoroastrianism is one of the most earliest recorded monotheistic religion on the planet. To put it in a nutshell, Prophet Zarathustra preached in one God. Now there's propaganda today, mainly coming from the Saddam era, where Saddam referred to them as Majusi fire worshippers. It's not true. The Zoroastrians don't worship fire. The fire thing is actually a latter innovation. However, fire is meant to represent God's light, the one God. Zoroastrians don't worship fire. Just like Jewish people don't worship ruins of the second temple and Muslims don't worship the black house in Saudi Arabia. These are merely positions of vibration to connect spiritually to the world of God. Days of Mashiach. And this is what the Navi Cheskel speak about, Gogu Magog. Mohammed Gogu Magog. Some people wanted to say that World War II was Gogu Magog. 50 million people died or more. But that cannot be. Because if you read the description of Gogu Magog, first of all, it has to be together with Mashiach. 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 The Jewish idea of a coming of a saviour or messiah was influenced by Zoroastrianism messianism. Already in the book of 2nd Isaiah, Isaiah was one of the most popular works among Jews in the Second Temple period, written during exile. The prophet speaks of a saviour who would come to rescue the Jewish people, a benefactor, anointed by God to fulfil his role. In many verses, he identifies Cyrus the Liberator as the Messiah. Cyrus the Great was the founder of the Achaemenid Empire and King of Persia from 559 to 530 BC. He's venerated in the Hebrew Bible as Cyrus the Messiah for conquering Babylon and liberating the Jews from captivity. Cyrus was a great king. 
He was a devout Zoroastrian, following monotheism, the concept of one god. Cyrus was a tolerant ruler who allowed his non-Iranian subjects to practice their own religion. So the Book of Isaiah was heavily influenced by Zoroastrian belief because the belief of a messiah is first recorded in Zoroastrianism itself. The growth of messianic ideas is parallel in both Jewish and Iranian thought. Zarathustra in his Gatas, which are believed to be written by Prophet Zoroastra himself, describe a Sayoshiant, saviour, as anyone who is a benefactor of the people. Similarly, in Jewish prophecy, the Messiah is not a single special saviour, but there could be multiple, and they are usually anyone who does great things for the Jewish people even if that person is to be a Persian king following Zoroastrianism, as was Cyrus the Great. It was 70 years ago that the United States under President Truman recognized the state of Israel. Ever since then, Israel has made its capital in the city of Jerusalem, the capital the Jewish people established in ancient times. Today, I am the chosen one. The truth is the Talmudic rabbis copied from Zoroastrianism and incorporated it in their belief. As you know, these prophecies are reused all the time, mainly for political purposes. Zoroastrianism talks about three messiahs, the first one being Prophet Zarathustra. Zend Avesta, which is one of the books of Zoroastrianism, says that the burning fire that they used to have constantly burning in their temple will actually be extinguished and the second Seoshiant will come. Historically speaking, it's reported that when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born, for the first time that fire was extinguished in Persia. So potentially he could have been the second Seoshiant referred to in the Zend of Esther. The Talmudists took this fire-burning prophecy and incorporated it in their Talmud about the prophecies of the destruction of the second temple, as I discussed earlier. Anyway, the last Seoshiant, or the final messiah, is a mysterious figure in Zoroastrianism. He comes in the end times, from Persia, at a time when religion declines. There's wars and rumours of wars. In the Horda Avesta, it's written that he comes when the sky withholds its rain. The sun stands at midday for ten days and ten nights. The Seoshiant will come to save the world from Angramenu. The embodiment of evil, which can be described as the Antichrist figure. The Seoshiant will perform Yasna, which is prayer, and many dead people will be revived. My friends, the same concept is found in Jewish prophecies of end times, when Jews will be resurrected, when the Messiah comes. Many teachings crept into the Talmud literature, and the rabbis just adapted the old material for their new dispensation. Today, there are powers trying to manipulate our reality by using prophecies and assigning it to Israel. They put a snake on the wailing wall, saying this is a sign that the arrival of the Messiah is imminent. They genetically modified a red heifer, saying that's another sign of the Messiah coming. The red heifer is interesting though because it's said that when the Messiah in Jerusalem finally arrives, Jewish priests will start sacrificing red heifers. Red heifers without blemish. This again is a copy from Zoroastrianism. The ritual sacrifice in Zoroastrian temple is called Atas Zohor. So you see, dear friends, our reality is manipulated. I believe the final Redeemer will come, but to believe that something will happen to the Holy Mosque in Palestine is nonsense, it's twisted, it's political, and it's evil. I'm not sectarian, neither do I believe in pushing faith. I respect all divine faiths, because I believe there's truth and goodness in all of them. However, don't believe in the evangelist and the Zionist narrative of the Third Temple. Remember, under Saladin's command, the Ayyubid army defeated the Crusaders at the decisive Battle of Hatton in 1187, and thereafter wrestled control of Palestine, including the city of Jerusalem, from the Crusaders, who had conquered it years earlier. 
Saladin did not wait. He didn't believe in these prophecies. He could have waited, saying, eventually Palestine will be gone anyway because some Antichrist will come and then establish a third temple there. So any battle is futile. But he didn't, did he? Instead, he stormed and freed Palestine. To my friends who follow Judaism, if you still want to believe that the third temple prophecy will be fulfilled, then let me tell you, it's already fulfilled. By God's command, what is a temple? It's merely a building to worship God. Al-Aqsa is that temple. A temple where the God of all is worshipped. The third temple. It was demolished during many conquests of Jerusalem, but today it stands and it will continue to stand till the end of time. No matter how much we want to force the hand of God, the mission to remove this holy temple will never materialize. And my final message to evangelists, again, I'm not here to convert you. You may believe whatever you want, but supporting the idea of a third temple is demonic. If you want to take inspiration from the New Testament, then see goodness, not politics, neither disharmony. See that Yeshua came as a sacrifice. There's no need to sacrifice red heifers. And Yeshua also became the high priest to preach the Bible. So there's no need to have priests in a third temple. In other words, sacrifices and temple worship have lost their need. All third temple prophecies are just propaganda. It's time to wake up. Have a lovely night.